Okay, what about now? Yep. <laughs> okay, great. So it's a distinct honor and privilege to introduce a man who really doesn't need much of an introduction to all of us, uh, our very own Dr. Ralph Rubin. Um, he's a professor of pathology and oncology and the Baxley Professor and Director of the Department of Pathology at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago uh, and is a 1985 School of Medicine alumnus. Uh, he's also the director of the Saul Goldman Pancreatic Cancer Research Center at Johns Hopkins and a recognized uh, uh, leading and world expert in uh, pancreatic neoplasms, including uh, the description of tannins. Um, Dr. Rubin has received many awards. Uh, several notable ones, including the Frank H. Netter Award for Special Contributions to Medical Education, um, the 2013 John Hopkins Distinguished Alumni Award, and uh, an election to the German National Academy of Science, Leopold Zina, in 2013. Um, received many teaching awards here at John Hopkins as well, and has published more than 800 scientific papers a vast majority on pancreatic neoplasms, as well as eight books. Produced an award-winning documentary on the life of the surgeon, uh, the founding surgeon uh, here at John Hopkins, William Stewart Halstead. Uh, and we're about to hear about what's probably going to be the next award-winning effort. Um, a recent book, A Scientific Revolution, 10 Men and Women Who Revisited American Medicine. Uh, Dr. Rubin is truly an uh, inspiration for all of us in the many different uh, contributions he's made, both scientific, in education, and in the humanities. Um, and when I grow up, I want to be like him. So, Dr. Rubin, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Avi. Um, uh, uh, first, I want to uh, acknowledge my co-author, Will uh, Lindner. Uh, Will is, uh, the collaboration with Will has been such a pleasure. It's the way I think life should be. I, I love to tell stories and Will's a, a, a great writer. I love the 50,000 foot view and he uh, is love, has a great eye for evocative details. And so I, my one wish for everyone attending is that in life you can have a collaboration as uh, fruitful and wonderful as the one I've had with Will. Um, these are my disclosures, the objectives, and I wanted to add a few additional objectives. Uh, neither Will nor I are trained historians, so please take what we say with a grain of salt. And one of our greats, Osler, cautioned us on biography, said, what more delightful in literature than biography, and yet how uncertain and treacherous is the account which any man can give of another's life. Um, I, I have not met any of the 10 I'm going to talk about, um, and so I'm going to give, a, a, obviously, a tiny sliver of each. Um, and history uh, as studied through biography is obviously incomplete, and I recommend anyone who's interested in history, the Department of History of Medicine has a wonderful online program. And I do want to reemphasize I don't receive royalties for the book. This is a work of love of Hopkins. Um, so why bother with medical history and uh, go to the first chairman of pathology, uh, William Henry Welsh, who uh, famously said, I think there has never been a time where the past has had more wisdom to give. We should not go bluntly against all of the teaching of human experience. And just as it was true in Welsh's time, I think it's also true today. Um, uh, history also offers uh, shared stories, and uh, on July 4th, a year ago, uh, the New York Times reporter David Brooks had a wonderful piece that talked about shared stories. He was talking about shared stories for our nation, but I think they apply here. Great nations thrive by constantly refreshing the stories we tell about ourselves. These stories give us a sense of who we are, what we find admirable, and what kind of a world we hope to build together. So a scientific revolution, this book is about shared stories. Um, as the pandemic tore through uh, our communities and tore our communities apart, I wanted to share stories that would bring us uh, back together, uh, bring us back together as a community. Um, the scientific revolution uh, is about shared stories that transformed uh, medicine in America. They're focused on Hopkins because that's where that uh, uh, fundamental transformation uh, occurred. The arcs of the lives of each of the 10 men and women that we present, I think, are just truly exemplary. Um, and, uh, but there are also stories of unabashed racism, xenophobia, and sexism. 
Um, and I think it, most importantly, these stories have lessons for us today. Um, also, as we face the pandemic and heard from too many anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers, we also wanted to highlight the extraordinary sacrifices when it, that went into the medical ad advances uh, that too many people now take for granted. Um, so let's go back in time to the late 19th, early 20th century, and uh, uh, something I, I just love when Harvard's president, Charles Eliot, uh, in 1869, proposes written exams for the medical students, and the surgeon Henry Bigelow uh, protests that he actually proposes to hold written examinations for the degree of doctor of medicine. I had to tell him he knows nothing about the quality of Harvard medical students. More than half of them can barely write. Of course, they can't pass written exams. Um, and these are doctors. Uh, uh, some more, uh, you know, there are 100 medical schools who would accept anyone, and I underline anyone, willing to pay. Uh, uh, fewer than 20% required a high school diploma. And uh, what's I just love the Flexner Report of 1910 uh, described uh, the state of medical education in the United States, saying medical schools are filled with students, quote, too stupid for the bar and too immoral for the pulpit. Um, and most medical students would graduate without touching a patient. Uh, so you just imagine, these are the doctors who would treat you. Uh, and give one uh, uh, example, probably one of the more famous surgeons in the early 1800s, Robert Liston, was famous because he could take your leg off in, in two minutes or less. And prior to anesthesia, and remember, uh, ether was introduced in 1846. So even though they show ether in this side here, this was probably done pre-ether. Um, he was uh, probably one of the best surgeons, and there's a famous episode in which he took off, amputated the leg of a patient, um, and accidentally severed the fingers of his assistant who was holding the leg, um, and the, when his knife went way back, and the patient died of infection, his assistant died of infection, and the story goes that the person behind him also died. So three people uh, died from one operation. So that's the state of American medicine. But there was one medical school that required students to have a college degree, to be fluent in French and German, and to have a strong background in science. There was one medical school that brought students to the wards, so they actually saw and learned from patients. There was one medical school that applied science to medicine. And this uh, served as a model of its kind that then, uh, uh, as the message uh, promulgated across the country, forever changed uh, medicine in America. And that, of, of course, is uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, so a scientific revolution is about that uh, moment in time, that change, and it's focused on 10 men and women uh, who uh, really allowed that or drove that change. Um, I'm going to start with the first and then go to the last and give them in detail, and then I'm going to quickly go through the middle eight uh, in the interest of time. So let's start with the first of our 10, Mary Elizabeth Garrett, and many people say it should be the Mary Elizabeth Garrett School of Medicine. Uh, here at Hopkins, and I'll explain why. She's born in 1854. While her brothers are sent to Princeton, she was prevented from going to college. Uh, as she wrote, I begged my father that I should be allowed to go to college, and it was denied her. Uh, Gilman, who was the first president of Johns Hopkins University, denied her admissions to the college because young women uh, should, quote, not be exposed to the rougher influences, which I am sorry to confess are still found in colleges and universities where young men resort. Uh, those rougher influences are still probably present, but uh, uh, thankfully we admit women now. Um, so instead of going to college, she became what she called Papa's secretary. Um, she traveled with her father, who was the chairman of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and developed a deep understanding of the family business. Uh, as her father became progressively ill, she quietly took over much of the family business. Um, he died in 1884, uh, and at the age of 30, uh, Mary Elizabeth Garrett inherited a third of his fortune, one of the largest fortunes of the day. As she said, I was uh, surprised. What is really surprising, what is really remarkable of what is what she did with her fortune. Um, uh, as, as she said, to, that women should rise above the dull commonplace of their lives was her goal. So remember, she'd been denied college admissions. So the first thing she does is uh, founds a school for girls here in Baltimore to prepare them uh, for college, the Bryn Mawr School. It's now off of Northern Parkway. Uh, she uh, funds the, the founding of it and helps design it. And, and uh, quote, the prescribed course will be so arranged as to include the highest requirements for entrance made by any college. 
uh, to prepare uh, girls for college. What I find also very interesting is she herself had a, a physical problem. She, had, she wore a brace on her leg. Um, and despite that, uh, she insisted that the school have one of the best equipped gymnasiums in the country. Uh, so she starts the Bryn Mawr School for Girls. Then Johns Hopkins University, which uh, had already been founded. Remember, Johns Hopkins himself dies on Christmas Eve, 1873. In his will, he financially tied the university to the B&O Railroad. Uh, he wouldn't allow the stocks to be sold. Um, so the university fell into serious financial crisis. And, quote, the fi fiasco of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad system threatens to paralyze the university. Uh, President Gilman, it becomes desperate. Uh, the hospital was scheduled to open in 1889, but the university had only $67,000 left to build the medical school. So Gilman uh, sends out an announcement that $100,000 is needed to open the School of Medicine. Um, so uh, Mary Elizabeth Garrett and her friends, and there were uh, five of them who were daughters of the wealthy uh, Baltimoreans, and uh, uh, Miss Garrett is in the center, and M. Carey Thomas is over on the left in a black dress. Um, uh, developed the scheme. Uh, and here's a letter from M. Carey Thomas to Garrett, uh, quote, to raise $100,000 if the trustees would vote to accept such a gift subject to the condition that women be admitted to the medical school on the same terms as men. Uh, so they uh, try to raise $100,000. Uh, um, and as they're doing it, they note that Gilman would rather not open the medical school than open one to women. Um, they, they, the committee they formed to raise the money, the Women's Fund Committee, presented their offer to the Board of Trustees uh, to donate $100,000, about half of which uh, was from Garrett, under the condition that women be admitted on the same conditions as men. Um, the trustees uh, accepted the donation as the uh, foundation for the required $500,000. So they then uh, increased the uh, bar fivefold. Uh, Garrett offers additional, an additional 100,000 of her own money. If the trustees could raise the balance, they could not, and the men could not raise a penny. Uh, uh, so uh, Garrett takes the things into her own hands and agrees to contribute uh, the balance, $306,977. I love it, she wouldn't give them a penny more than uh, they asked for. Um, uh, but now she attached six terms, and I'm showing three of them here. Uh, first, that Hopkins admit women and men to the medical school with no distinction. Uh, she had an uh, unprecedented academic terms. Remember, this is someone who had been denied a college education, and yet she's setting the bar so high um, that uh, equal to the great European universities, that Hopkins, quote, shall be exclusively a graduate school, shall form an integral part of the Johns Hopkins University, and shall provide a four years course to the degree of Doctor of Medicine. At that time, most medical schools were just two years, uh, and the second year repeated the first year under the assumption that the students couldn't pass the first year. Uh, uh, students had to, quote, have a good reading knowledge of French and German, and shall study physics, chemistry, and biology. Um, and the response from the Board of Trustees and from Gilman was uh, 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 just a, a, a battle ensued. Um, they visited Garrett's Mount Vernon home pleading for concessions. Um, they fought, quote, with treachery and false reason, a tangle of hatred, malice, detraction that beggars description. I love that the description of it. Uh, and Garrett refuses to budge. Gilman gives in. And uh, uh, as a result, the school opens. And uh, as uh, Osler, the first chair of medicine here, uh, famously said, it's lucky we got in as professors, we could never enter as students. Um, and so here's the class of 1900, and you can see the women uh, dressed in white and, and the men in darker clothing. Um, so she's established the, the uh, grade school and high school. She's established the medical school. Uh, and now what comes in between is, of course, a college or undergraduate. Bryn Mawr's College up in Pennsylvania had already been opened in 1885. Um, but uh, Garrett then offers to donate $10,000 annually to Bryn Mawr College if the trustees elected her friend, M. Carey Thomas, remember that's the woman in a black dress, to the presidency. Over her lifetime, Garrett contributes almost uh, $500,000 to Bryn Mawr College. So she's uh, founded a preparatory school for girls, helped build Bryn Mawr College and the medical school. Right, quite remarkable. She dies in 1915. 
And you can visit her uh, grave site here at Greenmount Cemetery near the hospital. And on a, uh, it says, a woman of quiet, realized enthusiasm. She served her day and her generation well and will be long remembered by those for whom she labored. Uh, so when I think of Mary Elizabeth Garrett, I think of equity and excellence. And one wonders whether the medical school shouldn't rightly be named after her. So now we're gonna go all the way to the end, uh, to, the, to the last of our 10. Uh, Vivian Thomas, and he's the uh, uh, only one of the 10 who had an award-winning movie made at, uh, uh, based on his life uh, that starred a rapper, Mos Def, uh, called Something the Lord Made. And uh, so let's go through Vivian. Uh, he was a grandson of an enslaved person. His high school educated. Um, he had hoped to go to college. He was working in high school as a carpenter, saving up money for college. Uh, but lost all of his uh, savings when the depression hit and had to go back to work. He worked as a surgical assistant to the surgeon uh, Alfred Blaylock, who was at Vanderbilt at the time studying shock. And they did a really horrific but remarkable uh, studies. They were interested in whether shock was caused by a toxin or by the loss of blood. And so what they would do is crush a dog's leg and uh, half of the dogs they would let be, the other half they would tightly put the leg in a cast so there could be no uh, loss of fluid into the uh, um, uh, connective tissues. And the dogs who they tightly uh, casted survived, showing that uh, shock was in many ways caused by loss of fluid. And this had an enormous impact during the Second World War uh, when uh, uh, young men in the battlefield were injured, they were given fluids based on this work. Um, for pay, uh, Vanderbilt cl classified uh, Mr. Thomas as a janitor. Um, uh, Thomas came to Hopkins uh, when, when Blaylock was uh, brought here as the chair of surgery in 1941. At the time, the pediatric cardiologist, Helen Tausig, who we'll learn more about, uh, had observed that children with tetralogy of Fallot died uh, from a lack of, uh, uh, of blood flow to the lungs, not from heart failure. Um, and so Thomas was charged with the task of creating a blue baby-like heart condition in dogs, and then surgically restoring the blood flow to the lungs uh, by anastomosing the subclavian artery to the arm down into the pulmonary artery. So reestablishing blood flow to the lungs. Uh, so this is uh, in dogs. Uh, Thomas performed uh, probably several hundred of these operations on dogs and perfected the operation. He's the gentleman standing in the center here. And uh, here's the, his first success, uh, Anna, who they uh, successfully were able to anastomose the, the subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery. And Anna lived and, and was frolicking around the halls of Johns Hopkins for years. And her portrait is in uh, comparative pathology uh, to this day. Um, but to understand the accomplishments, um, remember you're, they're operating on tiny vessels here. And these are the, the, uh, the surgical instruments they used for, for suturing. These are just basically sewing needles that uh, Thomas shortened and sharpened uh, so they could get into those tiny cavities. When you think of modern surgery, this was not in any ways uh, what you and I are, are used to. Um, this was uh, primitive stuff, but they were nonetheless successful. So Thomas has perfected this in, in dogs. Uh, uh, Al Blaylock is, is busy being the chairman of surgery here. Um, and then in 1944, a 15-month-old Eileen Saxon is brought to Hopkins. Uh, she weighed just five kilograms. Uh, she's 15 months and only weighs 11 pounds and could barely drink uh, without losing her breath. Uh, her lips were intensely blue. And uh, Helen Tausig, the pediatric cardiologist, uh, diagnoses her as having tetralogy of Fallot. It's clear that she would die if nothing's done. And so Tausa goes to Blaylock and says, you have to do that operation that you've been experimenting with. Um, and on November 29th, 1944, uh, they, uh, Blaylock agrees to do this. The head of anesthesiology, Dr. Lamont, uh, refuses to participate. He thinks it's too dangerous an operation. Uh, Thomas had performed the operation uh, several hundred times. Uh, Blaylock had only uh, performed it once in, on a dog in the lab and as Thomas's assistant. So it took enormous bravery for uh, Blaylock uh, to, uh, perform, to agree to perform this operation. 
Um, and during the first surgery, Thomas uh, stood at Blaylock's shoulder and coached him through the procedure. So here you can see uh, Al Blaylock operating with his hands in the surgical field and standing behind him with his hands uh, uh, folded together is Vivian Thomas um, helping to guide Al Blaylock through this. As Alex Haller said, it was a question of trust. Um, uh, the uh, chatter in the operating room was, had been recorded and uh, between Blaylock and Vivian Thomas. So Blaylock asking Thomas, will the subclavian reach the pulmonary once it's cut off and divided? Is the incision long enough? Is this all right, Vivian? And then uh, uh, Thomas would answer the other direction, Dr. Blaylock. And uh, throughout these, uh, uh, this operation and a number to follow, uh, Blaylock would say only Vivian is to stand there. He would only allow Vivian Thomas to stand behind him and is to his right. And I love this one. Now you watch Vivian and don't let me put these sutures in wrong. Um, so uh, the uh, first operation is a success as uh, Denton Cooley, and we have a Cooley Center here, said, I remember when Dr. Blaylock took the clamp off the, the subclavian artery, the blood began to flow back into the pulmonary artery. We watched the baby turn from blue to pink. Really uh, quite remarkable. Eileen Saxon, the, I think the anastomosis would eventually thrombose and she would pass away, but there were a number of successes that followed. This was published in the Journal of American Medical Association, and as a result, children came from around the world to Hopkins, so literally mothers and fathers carrying their, their babies, their blue babies, uh, without an appointment often to the uh, doors of Hopkins. By 1951, over a thousand children underwent the operation in Hopkins with a mortality rate of five uh, percent. Um, uh, uh, Thomas uh, uh, would continue to work in the lab, um, and uh, Blaylock said of Thomas that one of his later operations, when he examined the heart of the dog that Vivian had operated on, well, this looks like something the Lord made, and that's the basis for the title uh, for the movie. Uh, Thomas taught a generation of surgeons and medical students surgical techniques uh, at Hopkins uh, in the dog lab. And uh, Denton Cooley said, even if you never had seen surgery before, you could do it because Vivian made it look so simple. And I love this quotation from uh, Rowena Spencer, who uh, trained here at Hopkins and went on to become a pediatric surgeon. When asked where she learned her beautiful surgical technique, Dr. Spencer would answer, from a black man with a high school education. And I think that uh, says an enormous amount. Um, but here, the, the, Thomas is playing such a critical role in this, and I don't mean to poo-poo what Al Blaylock did, uh, but uh, Thomas also contributed enormously, and yet he faced uh, unimaginable uh, racism. Uh, Hopkins was racially segregated at the time. Uh, Thomas had to enter the hospital through the back door. He was not allowed to enter through the front door of the hospital. He was discouraged from wearing his white coat. He wore a white coat in the research lab but uh, uh, was discouraged from wearing it when he walked in through the halls of the hospital. He had to use segregated restrooms and uh, was never included in any articles, group pictures, or dinners, except for as a bartender. Um, really a sad uh, piece of Hopkins history. Um, and when I graduated from medical school in 1985, uh, Thomas had autobiography was published. And uh, I distinctly remember being told a number of times, well, you know, Thomas didn't write that autobiography. It was written by Mark Ravitch, the surgeon, uh, who uh, was a, a white surgeon at, at Hopkins. And the reason is because the preface was written by Ravitch. And so people assumed that actually Ravitch had ghost written it because a black man couldn't write uh, that well. In fact, uh, for this book, we had the privilege, you can go to the archives and you can see at the top, uh, the original drafts of each chapter in Vivian's handwriting, uh, uh, and you can go down and, and it matches almost word for word uh, the final version of the manuscript. There are some letters between uh, Th Thomas and Ravitch, but they're mostly Ravitch saying, oh, why don't you expand a little bit on Helen Tausig's personality? Um, and there are also letters from Ravitch to the dean in which he, it appears that he's reporting to the dean on what Thomas is writing about, kind of, I guess, making sure Hopkins' reputation wasn't being tarnished. So he was also a little bit of a spy. Um, uh, Thomas dies of pancreatic cancer in 1985. 
and his uh, portrait uh, sits in the first floor of the uh, Blaylock Research Building. And here you can see his portrait. And I love his hands in this. Remember his enormous surgical skill uh, facing across the way the portrait of Al Blaylock. So when I think of uh, Vivian Thomas, I think of uh, facing uh, discrimination. Um, so a scientific revolution is about 10 men and women. We've talked about Mary Elizabeth Garrett and, and Vivian Thomas. And I'm gonna briefly, just very briefly touch on the other eight. And I should point out these uh, uh, illustrations, these portraits are done by uh, David Reaney, who's here in Ars Applied to Medicine. For this book, he kindly made an original drawing of each of them. I think they capture their personalities wonderfully. So our second uh, in order after Mary Elizabeth Gary is John Shaw Billings. He's born in Allensville, Indiana, a small town in Indiana. Um, his biography is appropriately entitled Order Out of Chaos. Um, he's born in Indiana, he goes to medical school, graduates at extremely young age. Um, and then the Civil War breaks out and he volunteers for the North and takes the officer's exam. And he scores so high uh, that they say, well, no one from Indiana can be that smart. So they make him retake it. And he scores, I think, even higher. Uh, he's a surgeon uh, for the North. And believe it or not, he's the surgeon at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. And uh, he writes letters to his wife, um, one of which is trying to make order out of chaos. Another took an hour to get the blood out of my hair. And you can see the toll that the war took on him in these uh, before and, and after uh, photographs, just unimaginable. And after Gettysburg, he never operates again in the day in his life. Uh, it's such so devastating. Um, but he doesn't give up. And that's what I love about each of these, the arcs of each, the lives of each of these 10. He goes on, they have a call to design the hospital and, and he's the one uh, who designs Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. He recruits many of the first uh, greats to Hopkins, including William Henry Welsh and William Osler. He establishes the early philosophy of science applied to medicine uh, for the medical school and particularly by choosing Welsh. He, he yeah, makes sure that comes to fruition. He develops punch cards uh, to keep track of journal articles. And this become, punch cards become the basis for IBM, uh, for the establishment of IBM. Uh, he uh, establishes the index catalog uh, to keep track of journal articles, which becomes the foundation for modern PubMed. He builds uh, the National Library of Medicine, one of the most beautiful medical libraries on the NIH campus. And he becomes the head of the New York Public Library. And those, that uh, uh, library with the beautiful lions in front, he's the one who uh, helped design the reading room on the second floor and helped make that possible. Um, and uh, the, the dome, if you will, is now uh, named after him. It's the uh, Billings Building in his honor. So when you walk through this building, remember uh, John Shaw Billings. Our third is uh, William Henry Welsh, who was the first chairman of pathology and the first dean. And to get a sense of where he was coming from, because that, as you think of the arcs of each of their lives, this is Welsh standing on his porch with his family. Uh, his father is the bearded, uh, long white beard, and his grandmother is sitting. His mother died when he was young. His father was a physician in Connecticut, and his treatment for rattlesnake bites was to take copper filings from a penny uh, from the reign of Queen Anne uh, and mix it with vinegar and then put that into the, the rattlesnake bite. And as his biographer said, fortunately rattlesnakes in Connecticut were not very poisonous, but this is the background from which Welsh is emerging. And he goes on uh, on his 80th birthday to be on the cover of Time as the most influential uh, uh, physician scientist uh, in America and uh, probably ever. Um, and so an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, career in which he led uh, the transformation of American medicine from, uh, as I described it earlier, into one based on science. Um, and so it's science applied to medicine. He personified the idea of science applied to medicine. He gave priority to original sources over textbooks. And to the, describing his research lab where so many greats train, a general spirit of research, a fine spirit that poor clinicians and laboratory men were living together under circumstances of delightful intimacy. He, he really brought uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to reality the dream that uh, John Shaw Billings had of science applied to medicine. 
Um, but he, uh, he was called Popsy because he knew everyone and everyone loved him, but he also probably had a secret life and there's no proof of this, but there's, I think, a lot of evidence um, uh, from one of his relatives who wrote, he liked Dr. Dennis greatly as a friend and probably as a companion. It's almost certain that William Walsh was gay. And there's such, I think, sadness uh, in this guy who's everybody's friend and at the same time, nobody really knows him, but he had to hide his sexual orientation because it was not accepted at the time. So when I think of, of Welsh, I think of medicine through the lens of science, of unselfish generosity, and the sadness of a hidden self. Uh, next is uh, William Osler, uh, probably the greatest physician North America has ever produced, uh, who really defined what it means, the philosophy of what it means to be a physician. Um, he trained in Canada, and interestingly, for a, a great internist, his fundamental training was he would uh, follow his patients on the wards, and then when they died, he would do their autopsy, and he's the gentleman with the top hat uh, who's seated, and I love this uh, quote from, you know, hoity-toity boys, look at this, um, so he was able to listen to the heart sound and then hold the heart in his hand and look at the heart bound, so it became an extraordinary uh, clinician because of this. He was recruited to Hopkins by John Shaw Billings, uh, where he wrote his textbook, Principles and Practice of Medicine. And, and this room is still open, to, uh, uh, preserved, if you want to visit on the second floor of the Billings building. Um, he wrote this textbook, which brought him uh, you know, fame and recognition as, as the uh, great clinician that he was. Um, but more importantly, I think, is his philosophy. And I'll only show a couple examples of it, uh, bedside teaching. Uh, he wrote, I'm firmly convinced that the best book of medicine is the book of nature is written large in the bodies of man. You remember the answer of the immortal Hunter. Hunter remembers, of course, the surgeon from England who, when asked what books the student should read in anatomy, he opened the door of the dissecting room and pointed to the tables. Um, he also, uh, uh, not only about what it means to be a physician, but about a human being as well. Uh, I love your fellow man. Uh, nothing will sustain you more potently than the power to recognize your humdrum routine, as perhaps it may be thought, the true poetry of life, the poetry of the commonplace, of the ordinary man, of the plain toil worn woman with their loves and their joys, their sorrows and their griefs. An extraordinary human being as well. But uh, new research has come out that he probably held, uh, clearly held uh, strong biases. Uh, in, in one article he wrote, we are bound to make our country a white man's country. Um, and uh, so for me, if, if someone like as great as Osler could have unconscious biases, imagine someone as flawed as I am, I, I must have gazillions of them that I'm just not aware of. And he, he was not aware of them either. Um, so when I think of Osler, I think of patient-focused teaching, the philosophy of being a physician, and unconscious bias. Next is William Halstead. Uh, uh, he's born in New York, a wealthy, uh, rigorous athlete. He's here on the right and the back. Uh, scores the first touchdown ever scored in a football game played in the United States. Um, he becomes a surgeon, uh, trains at Columbia, and he is in practicing in Manhattan, and he is bold and daring. In 1881, his sister develops uncontrolled bleeding following a delivery of her first baby. He's called, uh, stops the hemorrhage, but she'd lost a, a significant amount of blood. And so he plunges a needle into his own arm, directly removes the blood and transfuses his blood into her. It's probably the first transfusion performed in the United States and his sister recovered. Of course, he didn't uh, cross and match it um, and was lucky that they were the same blood type. In fact, he's really bold and really daring. In the following year, his mother was desperately ill. He arrives at her apartment in the middle of the night, finds her jaundice with tenderness over her gallbladder, and he diagnoses her with an infected gallbladder. And well, what would you do? Um, he, of course, uh, uh, by lamplight, uh, operates on her on a kitchen table, uh, drains pus from the gallbladder, and removes seven gallstones, and she lived for years. And this operation had only been performed twice before in the United States. It is one of the first uh, gallstone removals on, on his mother on the, uh, on the kitchen table, which I think is just uh, quite remarkable. But he's also a scientist. He reads uh, uh, about the uh, from a student of Sigmund Freud, that if you put cocaine in the eye, you can touch the eye. So he starts experimenting with cocaine and he becomes a cocaine addict and later switched to morphine. 
he comes here to Hopkins, uh, William Henry Welsh, the first chairman of pathology, the dean brings him here and Halstead changes surgery for the next 30 years. Um, uh, takes it from, a, uh, it makes it a careful, uh, slow uh, uh, process in which there's gentle handling of the tissues. The whole time it turns out he remains uh, a, a secret addict. He never overcame his addiction. Um, so when I think of, of Halstead, I, I graduated from undergraduate University of Chicago. I think of the Phoenix uh, a bird. You know, he was a beautiful uh, a bird, a bold and daring in New York uh, and dies in the ashes and reborn here at Hopkins, a, a quite different but equally beautiful uh, person. Jesse Lazier, um, a clinical uh, a chemist, clinical pathologist here at Hopkins. Um, and yellow fever had broken out in Cuba after the Spanish-American War. And so the US government sends uh, four uh, uh, physicians down, three of the, which, the ones in bold, were trained by Welsh, uh, Walter Reed, Jesse Lazier, James Carroll, to go down and figure, is it caused by a mosquito or is it person-to-person -person transmission? And um, the, the group self-experiment. Um, on uh, page 100 of his notebook, Jesse Lazier wrote, guinea pig number one, September 13th, the, this guinea pig bitten today by a mosquito, this mi mosquito bit Suarez. And September 13th is the day Lazier said he was bitten. He had two children, uh, one who had just been born at the time. And here you can see his temperature chart. Uh, and this is 103, uh, 104, and then uh, it falls and he dies of his disease. And in his death, he showed that the, the mosquito was the vector uh, they then go out and put oil on the surface of water and eliminate the mosquito in Cuba and eliminate yellow fever. Um, so when I think of Lazier, I think of sacrifice. And indeed, if you go to the National Cathedral in DC, this is part of a much bigger stained glass. But one of the panels of the stained glass entitled Sacrifice, of course, you can recognize this Dr. Lazier uh, uh, putting the mosquito on his arm and showing its mode of transmission. Max Bradel. Uh, uh, the medical illustrator, uh, born in Leipzig, Germany in 1870. Uh, and I, I love the description of his illustrations. When any person endowed with a developed aesthetic sensibility first encounters a piece of Max Bradel's medical art, his, first, his, or, his or her first utterance is wow, invariably. And you can see that here in this beautiful illustration of a breach uh, delivery, this cutaway. Um, and uh, uh, Bradle's art carries bolts of melody as it so often stuns and dazzles. And so he's the one illustrating Halstead and, and Kelly's uh, uh, textbooks and, and, and articles. And you can imagine if you were lucky enough to have an illustration like this in one of your, your articles, how it would attract uh, great attention across the world and your peers. Um, how did he do it? Well, he obviously had enormous uh, talent, but he also, uh, approached it scientifically and carefully dissected cadavers um, whenever he had an illustration. And in one case, he cuts his hand and develops an infection of his hand. Um, and the infection starts to creep up his hand. And this is the days before antibiotics. So what would you do if this, you know, this means your certain death? Well, he drew a series of pictures outlining the, where the red part was and where the nerve loss was. Um, he, for some miraculous reason, the infection starts to, stops just as it gets up to his shoulder, regresses, but it leaves his hand kind of uh, partially paralyzed by, and so he studies cadavers and realizes there's a band of fibrosis blocking one of the nerves. And so he goes to Halstead and says, can you cut right here and free the nerve? Halstead does, and he can, uh, then his hand opens up and, and he can then illustrate again. So Bradle highlights the contributions of non-physicians and immigrants to medicine in the United States. Next is Dorothy Reed. Um, uh, Dorothy uh, graduated, uh, Mrs. Dr. Reed graduated uh, near the top of her medical school class here at Hopkins in 1900. Uh, she wanted to do an internship in medicine, uh, but, but because Florence Sabin had also graduated near her top of the class, it would mean uh, that the two of them would have to treat black male patients. Uh, Henry Hurd, the president of the hospital, said it would be a disaster. It couldn't be done. Included, accused her of being a sexual pervert for wanting to see black men. Um, and she said, no, until he, Osler, returns, sir, I shall be the intern of the colored wards. If in October I find that I cannot successfully complete my duties, I shall tender Dr. Osler my resignation. Um, she uh, is shown here on the far left. 
Um, and uh, she said, she wrote something Dr. Hurd said of a woman being irresponsible and not trusted to see things through, kept me at my post. She was the first intern to arrive in the morning, the last to leave, averaged uh, three or four hours of sleep. Um, she successfully completes her internship uh, and then uh, undergoes a fellowship. It takes a fellowship in pathology and research. Uh, and she, at the time, the Australian pathologist Sternberg had minced the lymph nodes of patients with Hodgkin disease and inoculated them into guinea pigs. And some of the guinea pigs developed tuberculosis. So he thought uh, Hodgkin disease was just a peculiar form of tuberculosis. She uh, studies it under the microscope and, and the microscopes and improved in resolution. Um, and as she said, I cannot understand the conception of the tubercle bacillus, which he suggests the cause of such a growth. I have little difficulty distinguishing the two processes. Now, the large giant cells, the most striking feature of these specimens, they vary in size from two to three red corpuscles to cells 20 times that size. The nucleus is always large. It may be single or multiple. And notice who illustrated the, the uh, 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 pictures in her article. She publishes an article on it. It's a single author, 65 page long, and she illustrated it, uh, fundamentally uh, changing our understanding of Hodgkin disease. Um, she uh, then applies for a faculty position here at Hopkins and Welsh denies her a faculty position. And she says, suddenly I saw what I had to face, acceptance of the injustice and being overlooked. I knew I couldn't take it. I told Dr. Welsh, if I couldn't look forward to a definite teaching position, uh, I couldn't stay. And so she leaves. Um, after the, probably the reason McCallum denied her a position is she was having an affair with the pathologist, the faculty member, William McCallum. After she left, McCallum in his textbook uh, repeatedly gave Dorothy Reed credit uh, for uh, discovering the, what's now called the Reed-Sternberg sound. And one of his, her biographers wrote, she gave him her heart, he gave her fame. And Will and I included that in the book. And then my wife read it and said, oh, uh, you're a sexist. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're saying women have to sleep with men to become famous. And I said, oh, I didn't even think of that. And I, I, I just in the process of writing highlights one's own unconscious biases. Um, so when I think of Dorothy Reed, I think of uh, bravery, intelligence, and strength in the face of hardship and discrimination. Um, interestingly, Garrett, had she lived, had, 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 had her fortunes remained, one of her wishes was that female faculty be treated equally as men, uh, but she had given her, left her fortune to Carrie Thomas, who unfortunately splurged and spent it all. Um, so Article 11th in Garrett's will, stipulating that uh, uh, Hopkins would get money if they provided equal opportunities for men and women, uh, never came to be. Our final one is Helen Towsett. Uh, as I mentioned, she uh, uh, was uh, critical in the blue baby operation. She had also made the seminal observation that children with tetralogy of Fallot, uh, whose ductus arteriosus remained open, lived longer than when they closed. And that, of course, became the basis for that subclavian artery to pulmonary artery uh, shunt. She founded the field of pediatric cardiology. Again, each of these people has incredible arcs. They faced incredible hardships. She was almost completely deaf in later part of her career. And she learned her lip read and she uh, also uh, used to feel the baby's heartbeats with her hands and could diagnose their heart conditions just with her fingertips. Um, but boy, was she tough. Um, and I'll give you a couple examples. Um, in the 1960s, one of her fellows who came back from Germany and said there was an outbreak of a focomelia, the kids as, as shown here where the hands essentially come out of their shoulders. She went to Europe uh, she's not the one who discovered the association, but uh, learned of the association of this with thalidomide, came back to the United States, sounded the alarm, and really prevented thalidomide from being introduced in the United States as a sleeping aid. And I love this. When we went over to the archives, you find a number of letters like this where she writes to Richard Nixon about the extension of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. Um, and uh, uh, she says about how young men's conscience tells them not to do it, and we ought to listen to these young men. Um, you know, it seems, please give this matter your serious consideration, a tough, a strong woman. Um, uh, at the end of her career, her fellows uh, commissioned a portrait of her by Jamie Wyeth of the famous Wyeth family. And this is the portrait. And uh, Jamie, who visited her up in uh, her Cape Cod home, described the process. She would just stare right at me intently with those blue eyes. It was so amazing. I don't think she had a care in the least how she looked. I love the idea that everything was secondary to her work. 
I was trying to show Dr. Tausig's steely mind and questioning attitude, not a Pollyanna woman, but a very intense woman. When this portrait was uh, unveiled, her uh, fellows were so disturbed by the intensity of it that they cried and ran out of the room and asked that it never be hung in the halls of Hopkins. And so to this day, it's over at the archives. Um, so that's a quick run through of a scientific revolution. Um, again, I wanna send a special thank you to my writing partner, Will Linder. And then I, I do wanna say that in writing the book, it got me thinking about what makes Hopkins special? And I'd like to uh, spend the last five or 10 minutes uh, with a more of an open discussion of this. You know, is it the buildings? Uh, no, but it's nice to have an iconic building. Is it money? No, but no money, no mission. Is it the brilliance of the people? I think it's required, but not enough. Uh, is it a bottom-up approach that the Dean doesn't tell us what to do? Well, I think the Dean also doesn't give us a lot of money for big projects. Um, so at various dinners, I, I've asked people this question. And John Kierman, who was the, uh, former head of uh, surgery said, we're right on the Mason-Dixon line. And as such, Hopkins combines the collegiality of the South with the drive of the North. And it's that perfect uh, mix. Uh, Patrick Walsh, who was the head of urology, said it's negative selection. Um, uh, Baltimore is a quirky place to live. The pay of Hopkins is low. The work is hard. And only a certain special type of person will come here. And so it's kind of a negative selection process. Chip Moses, who used to be uh, uh, leadership of the hospital, uh, email me, he thinks it's a lack of ego. Um, I, I don't think it's a complete lack of ego. There certainly is some. Kay Jameson, the famous psychologist who wrote An Unquiet Mind, uh, said simply, it's a heritage of excellence. And this is based on Tommy Turner's uh, book about Hopkins, that it's this heritage that I'm talking about that defines it. I had the honor of having lunch with Joe Biden. He talked about what made America special. And he said, possibilities. And I think that also applies to Hopkins. Um, but it's clear to me that it probably it depends on who you ask what makes Hopkins special. And, and Matthew uh, Crenson in his uh, political history of Baltimore uh, points out, you know, if you think of what makes Baltimore special and look at different uh, uh, movies, you know, if it's Barry Levinson, it's Diner and Liberty Heights. If it's David Simon, it's Homicide and The Wire. And if it's John Waters, it's Pink Flamingos and Hairspray, that we each have our own uh, uh, different interpretation. And so in the last five minutes, I wanted to open it up for a discussion about what defines Hopkins for you, uh, what makes Hopkins special, uh, a, a great place uh, for you. So uh, let me stop uh, sharing. And um, I, I think we have as panelists, Fred Sanfilippo, and I see Mike Borowitz and Karen Svano. So maybe I'll start, uh, uh, Fred, with you. I'll put you on the spot. No, Ralph, great, uh, great presentation, great book, really enjoyed reading. Very important, you picked 10 great folks. I, I guess um, my sense of why Hopkins is great and has remained great goes to uh, two of the uh, features that others have identified in great detail. Um, one is Jay Barney. And Jay Barney, uh, you may remember this from some of our retreats perhaps, but um, his, and he's got textbooks on this, sustainable competitive advantage is not based on intellectual property, et cetera. It's based on how you organize. And if you can organize in a way that is difficult and unique and others have a hard time emulating. And if you remember the structure of our department at Hopkins is unique and has been sustained and so on. Um, and I think the structure at Hopkins has been unique. Now Vanderbilt has tried to uh, uh, mimic it to some extent, but I think the unique aspect of Hopkins structure is that you have a health system and you have a university in the academic side, if you will, and the clinical side, and one does not completely dominate the other. When you have university-owned hospitals, you run into a lot of trouble. I can spend an hour on that. The other way around the same thing, but having this balance, and frankly, what happened in the 90s and created creating Hopkins Medicine as the delegated board showed how that unique uh, uh, structure can evolve to balance the missions. Um, but the other, the other feature of sustainable, um, uh, great enterprises, outstanding enterprises, is, is sort of the Jim Collins philosophy of uh, your culture, you know, mission, vision, values is what determines greatness. Now, one could argue very appropriately the culture in terms of some of the behavioral norms that you put out in the book was not great at Hopkins. I mean, it's segregated and so on. But the culture as it relates to the missions has been unique since I think the creation of Hopkins, that balance of research, education, 
uh, and patient care. And that has been a sustainable uh, advantage as well. So I'm always big on structure and function. So, you know, you have the one, how you organize, and the other in how you identify your values and your mission. And I think the important aspect of, of uh, Colin's work in particular and, and Barney's is that these things change dramatically when you have changes in leadership. And if you remember some of the follow-up books from Collins, and we had Collins at Hopkins actually back in the 90s. He was very helpful in, in a couple of retreats, uh, uh, identifying what that unique culture was. And it was collegiality. We had a whole retreat on that with him. So that was the unique feature of Hopkins was collegiality and the ability to work together. Um, but the leader can change that. So as we're going through another period of change with leadership at Hopkins, uh, you know, we have the opportunity to continue being great or you know, the risk of, of that changing. But uh, that, that's what, in, in my experience, what I think has made Hopkins great and, and it keeps it great. Great and wonderful. Thank you, Fred, and great to see you. Uh, Bill? Yeah. Oh, uh, thanks, Ralph. Um, so I, I actually, I, I love what Fred said about culture. Um, so for me, um, you know, I, I, 20 years ago, when I got offered to stay, I was going to stay one year and I couldn't get out of Baltimore fast enough. And, um, but the longer that you stay and you see the opportunity and the culture and this uh, focus on collaborative uh, team science uh, is just, it's just terrific. You can't see it replicated almost anywhere else. I, I haven't met anybody. Uh, what I, <laughs> when people say, well, why are you still at Hopkins? And I'd say, I've never met anybody with a better job than mine. And um, it's just, it's a terrific atmosphere. And, I, and um, you know, I, I can't imagine being anywhere else. Great. Thank you, Bill. That's great. Uh, Karen? Or... Hi. Uh, wonderful presentation, wonderful book. I'm going to have to read it now. <laughs> this is just so interesting. I learned so much and I was, you know, writing all sorts of notes about takeaway messages, but just to be, I guess, brief um, on the topic of what makes uh, Hopkins great. I, I'm sitting here jotting down notes of, you know, what I think. And I, from my um, experience, so I'm like Bill, when I came to Hopkins back in 2003 as a graduate student, I never really anticipated staying here um, and just what, would never manage to, to leave because it's such a, a great place. But what, what I, you know, in terms of the reasoning, um, what I see is that uh, those that tend to stay at Hopkins um, in terms of their motivations, and they're motivated to do good. Um, and to help people above, uh, you know, above, above ego, above scholarly, <laughs> above anything else. And, you know, I, I adore Pat Walsh, but I think that his reasoning actually resonated with me, this negative selection thing. It is a special type of, of person um, that stays here at um, Hopkins. And the other thing is just that in my own personal experience is the extraordinary mentors and teachers uh, and educators, uh, and that just, you know, put their absolute everything into training and, and into teaching. Um, and I really, you know, along with the collegiality and everything else, I think that is something that is very unique to Hopkins. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mike, and then Aaron. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for that talk, Ralph. I, I actually was going to ask you a question. And I'll, I'll pose the question first before my comments, and that is, how did you pick 10 and who would have been number 11? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, they, you know, one, they, they had to compute, but I love also the stories, the life, you know, so like Florence Sabin would be great, but her life arc to me wasn't as exciting. Um, uh, one I was, I would love is Murawski, uh, who the automatic internal defibrillator. One, I think it highlights the impact that Jews have, uh, the Jewish people have given to Hopkins is extraordinary. His life journey is amazing where, you know, the Nazis are coming, he flees Poland, goes all the way almost to India and you can't make up the story. Um, but he actually was at Mount Sinai here in, and not so much at Hopkins. So otherwise I would have included him as one, but thanks for asking. Anyway, so, so my thoughts, you know, when, when I, I think about sort of uh, all the time I've been here and and when I sort of talk to candidates, whether it's be for residency or faculty, and I sort of give them the general spiel, one of the things that I always sort of, um, one of the things I always raise for them, 
And, and one of the things that I think is really key to what, what life is like at Hopkins, I said, this is a place where if you want somebody to tell you where to go Tuesday morning at nine o'clock uh, and Wednesday afternoon at four o'clock, this is not the place for you. If this is a, if this is a place where what you see is this huge candy store where there's all sorts of resources, all sorts of people, they're so easily broken down, there, there aren't silos, it's easy to sort of navigate, the, once you learn how, it's easy to navigate around and you can take advantage of all the opportunities here, this is a wonderful place. And I, and I think that that's really, <clears throat> uh, and, and some, of the, some of the things that Fred said, some of the things that you said, I think sort of but, but speak to that, but I think it's just the ability to sort of take advantage for, for people who are enthusiastic to take advantage of all this place has to offer, I think is one of the one of its key features. Right. Possibilities, right? Possibilities, right. Possibilities. <laughs> and, and, and audience, feel free to chime in in the, the chat. Uh, Aaron and then Marissa. So, very, very, so Ralph, thanks for a wonderful uh, talk. It, it's great to learn more about all these individuals. And very similar to what others are saying. It, it's really the possibilities and, and the individuals on campus that make that that so special. I, I think many of us could replicate, you know, part of our career at, at other locations, but you know, the amount of clinical samples that we have at Hopkins, the amount of research opportunities is unparalleled. And when you co you know combine that with phenomenal colleagues, it, it's very hard to see that at other institutions. And I think, you know, some of the work that was done at COVID on campus is, is a perfect example with he Heba and Karen setting up testing so quickly, different uh, trials such as convalescent plasma trials and trials uh, to improve an immune response uh, for the immunosuppressed for COVID vaccines are just an example uh, of the, the leading edge we are at with at Hopkins. Thanks, Marissa. Yeah, really quickly. Thanks, uh, Ralph, for the beautiful grand rounds this morning. Um, Vivian Thomas' story is one that always makes me emotional um, as a person of color. Um, I, I think for me, what resonates the most is humility. I think there's an incredible sense of humility across all the faculty. Um, I think we all recognize that we're part of a very rich, storied and complex legacy here. Um, and we're trying to all do our part. So I think humility is one that resonates with me and the diversity. It's not remiss that there's only one person of color in your book, but I think that there's an incredible incredible sense of diversity in terms of everyone's different stories of life, different life experiences that we all here at Hopkins have. So that's what resonates with me. Great, thank you. And just reading some from the chat, uh, Tris Simner, uh, highly collaborative nature makes Hopkins great. I think our diversity drives success. Uh, um, let's see, um, uh, from a phone number, po the possibilities of greatness inspire us to do our best and our colleagues share this vision uh, that inspires collegiality. Um, uh, another one, um, the work environment is vibrant, rigorous, and prestigious, having Im outstanding impact on human welfare, enthusiastic collegiality in demanding environment survival uh, while pursuing excellence, and then a great support system. So. Uh, on that note, I don't want to go over uh, too much, but thank you all. Um, it, it's great to see everyone, um, and I welcome our new interns uh, uh, as they just started July 1st, and hopefully they'll be writing the, the next uh, uh, chapters uh, looking forward. Uh, thank you, everyone. Take care and be safe and have a wonderful summer. Bye-bye.